Scripture verse by verse. My name is Michael Barrett, and we are in the book of Psalms today. Once again, we're continuing through Psalms. We're in Psalm 97, and we resume our study in verse 1. Let's begin, as always, with prayer. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you have a Bible, open it up to Psalm 97. And we begin in verse 1. The Bible says, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad. You know, the only people who will not be happy when Jesus returns to rule over the earth are those who reject him. Those who love their sin, those who thrive on evil, those who love to destroy the innocent and the vulnerable won't be happy to see Jesus return to earth. They won't be happy when Christ is ruling with righteousness. Then again, it's irrelevant because they won't be here. By the time Jesus gets done with, him, with them, they'll be burning in hell. Verse 2. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Righteousness and justice govern everything that Jesus is and everything that Jesus does. Like an anchor, which prevents a boat from drifting with the current, justice and righteousness are anchored to Jesus, which is why he never drifts into wrong behavior. I remember, I guess it was about 20 years ago or so, there was a woman who posed inappropriately for a bad magazine. And the reason that I remember it is because she said that Jesus told her to do it. God led her to do that. Well, you know, Jesus never leads anyone to do anything that is wrong. And to even suggest that he is responsible for behavior like that is a blasphemous thing to say, terrible thing to say. I mean, it's bad enough to commit sin without saying Jesus wants me to do it or Jesus told me to do it. I did it because God wanted me to do it, liar. God's leading will never take anyone in any direction except that which is holy. Verse 3. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. Anyone who would dare stand in the way of God's righteous plans and refuse to move will eventually be removed forcefully and permanently the way a flamethrower removes straw. Verse 4. His lightnings light the world. The earth sees and trembles. I like a good thunderstorm. And in fact, as I make this recording, I hear a distant thunder outside of my window. So and now it's starting to rain, so we may hear some thunder. But I like a good thunderstorm. And I, one reason that I think I really like it is because it makes me feel a bit uneasy, and it should. You know that lightning is 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit? Can you imagine? 54,000 degrees above zero. That is six times the temperature of the surface of the sun. 54,000 degrees. In fact, lightning is so hot and it heats the air so quickly. And you can imagine why. Let's say the temperature outside is 80 degrees. Right now outside here it's 79 degrees. So we get a flash of lightning that goes by my window. Okay, the air molecules have just been increased in temperature from 80 degrees or 79 degrees to 54,000 degrees in a flash in less than a second. And so when lightning strikes, when lightning goes through the air, it, it heats the air molecules so quickly that they expand violently. And that causes what we know as thunder. The Bible says that God's lightning lights the world. And I think you probably know what God is talking about here. On a dark summer night, a single flash of lightning illuminates everything. I mean, you can have your shades pulled all the way down if you have shades. 
your blinds closed, your your drapes closed, whatever you might have in your house, and you still see the light, and it still lights up the room. Amazing. And the Bible says that lightning belongs to God. And then it says in verse 5, The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. Now, if you have ever seen the Rocky Mountains in person, you know that they are massive, majestic, and unmovable. Well, the Bible says that the mountains melt like wax before the Lord. That's just a poetic way of saying that God is bigger, stronger, and more majestic and more unmovable than the largest mountains anywhere on earth. In fact, if God ever came down to earth and he took a walk through Rocky Mountain National Park, and if those mountain mountains were conscious, they would humbly bow, back off, and melt in the presence of God. Verse 6, the heavens declare his righteousness, and all the peoples see his glory. How? Through the heavens. I love the night sky. Just love it. Unfortunately, I live in town where I can't see the, the stars like I used to. But I love the night sky nevertheless. I could look at it for hours. And the night sky tells us there's a powerful God out there who made the universe. The Bible says the heavens announce the glory of God. They declare the glory of God. It says that in the book of Romans, too. The heavens actually announce several things about God. They tell us that he is intelligent. They tell us that he is all-powerful. And people inherently understand that he is the one that they will answer to. People may not know his name, but if they are honest with themselves, they know that he exists. The heavens declare the existence of God and also his essential nature. When I look at the stars in the sky, I think of the God who made them. Like scripture says, they are his glory. The universe is actually God's vapor trail. It shows that he's been here. Verse 7. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods. I mean, when you've got a God who's wise enough and powerful enough to design and build the entire universe, a person would have to be a class A fool to worship anyone or anything other than him. And that's why the Bible says, let all be put to shame who boast in idols. And they will be. Everyone or everything that is worshipped by people will eventually bow before the one true God. And then, those who worship those other things will be put to shame. Well, just imagine how, when they stand before their Creator, they will be humiliated for being so foolish, for worshipping something or someone other than the one that they are standing before. Verse 8. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The whole world is not rejoicing over the judgments of God, over the ways of God today. But it is only a matter of time before God's perfect will will always be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. The world belongs to God, so he's not going to let all the corrupt be behavior that's going on continue indefinitely. God, yes, is giving people, bad people, time to repent and receive his Son as Lord and Savior because he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But eventually he's going to say, enough. That's it. And on that day when God says enough, things will be the way they should be. Verse 10, you who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the soul of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. You who love the Lord hate evil, which only makes sense. Because if you love someone, then the last thing you want to do is hurt them. The most natural thing is to do the things that please them. 
And Christians prove their love for God by their hatred for sin. Christians prove their love for God by staying away from what they may want if what they want is wrong. It's not always easy to say no to a sinful attitude or a sinful word spoken in haste. It's not always easy to say no to a knee-jerk sinful response to being sinned against. It's not easy. It's much easier to try to justify doing those things. It's not easy to say no to a temptation. It is much easier to justify somehow, some way, giving in to it. Our fallen human nature still wants to sin, but Christians prove their love for God by hating sin. You say, but that's not easy. Well, love isn't always easy, but that's one of the things that makes it so valuable. Loving God by doing what is right in His eyes isn't always easy. Many times it's very, very hard, but by doing it, we prove that our love is genuine and that our faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior, is real. Verse 11 says, Light is sown for the righteous. Life is Light, I should say, is given to the righteous. In other words, if you are godly, you will have light, meaning this. The more like Jesus we are, the more we will grasp the truth of God's Word. Harboring sin destroys a Christian's ability to learn what the Bible says, learn what it means, and how it applies. You harbor sin, you're cutting yourself off from those things. Consequently, moral compromise destroys the Christian's ability to fellowship with God and enjoy Him. And it goes on in verse 11. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. In other words, if we are good, then we will have joy. If we know Christ and we don't have any unconfessed sin in our life, if we are putting Jesus first the best that we possibly can, then we will have a joy that nothing in this world can match. The Bible does not say that we will have joy if everything goes our way. If we have everything that we want. The Bible says we will have joy if we are good. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 12. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. God is said to have a holy name, which simply means that God himself is holy, because the name represents a person. God is holy. He is perfect. And that's why we can trust him. People say, God's holiness scares me. Well, his holiness should scare us, especially if we're living in willful rebellion against him. On the other hand, think of it from a different angle. The Bible would mean absolutely nothing if God was not holy. The promise of salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ would be completely worthless if God isn't holy. Because among other things, God's holiness makes him reliable and truthful. Psalm 98. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Bible says that God has done marvelous things. You say, well, I guess, I don't know, maybe. Maybe nothing. God has done marvelous things. Two measly seconds in hell, two seconds in torment would be enough to prove to anyone that the Lord has done a marvelous thing by dying on the cross and giving us a way to avoid that horrible place. If everyone went to hell for two seconds, I doubt that anyone would take what Jesus did on the cross for granted. He has done marvelous things. If it is possible, that is a biblical understatement. There aren't enough superlatives in all the languages of the world combined to describe the greatness of Jesus and his work on the cross. Verse 2, the Lord has made known his salvation 
his righteousness he has openly shown in the sight of the nations. God shows his righteousness to the nations or to the people of the world. And one way he does it is through Christians today. By his faithful people, God reveals his righteousness to the rest of the world. You know that we are his representatives as Christians. The Bible says that we are his ambassadors. We are to live the way he wants us to live so that the world understands finally what the real Jesus is actually like. If we are Christians, then it is better for us to behave well than to complain about others who do not behave well. What I am saying is focus less on the failures of others. Focus more on how well you are representing Jesus Christ. Because that's why we're here. To show his righteous nature to the entire world. Verse 3. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Notice how his mercy is connected to his salvation. Accepting God's mercy, which by the way is an outgrowth of his love and his pity, is essential if we want to experience God's salvation. Well, someone says, I, I don't want pity from anyone, and that includes God. Well, then you will never experience God's salvation because it is based on the pity that God has for hell-bound sinners who are unable to save themselves. Salvation is all about God having pity on sinners. You say, well, I don't want it. Because I'm going to stand before God, man to man, and I'm going to tell him why I deserve to go to heaven. You will not. You'll get in through Jesus Christ if he's your Lord and Savior, or you will not get in at all. Stand and talk to God, man to man. What comic book you've been reading? Never happened. God doesn't save us because we deserve it. Because we don't. He doesn't save Christians because they have earned it, because they can't. He saves Christians for one reason. It's because they receive His mercy through Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other way. Verse 4, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Break forth in song. Rejoice and sing praises. And of course, all the earth does not shout joyfully unto the Lord, but it should. People are so busy enjoying the blessings of God that they take the God who blesses for granted. Having a wonderful God, having a wonderful Creator, having a wonderful Savior should make us happier than anything else. And that's not to say we can't enjoy the good things that we have. Of course we can. But it is to say that we should recognize that without our great and glorious Creator, we would have nothing. Verse 5, Sing to the Lord with the harp with the harp and the sound of a song, with trumpets and the sound of a horn, shout joyfully before the Lord the King. There are many things that make me happy, but nothing should make me more happier, more happy, I should say, than God. Especially when I think about how wonderful He is and all that He has done. Nothing should make me more happy than God. Because if he doesn't make me more happy than anything else in the world, then that just proves that I don't know him as I should. And I don't understand him as I should. And I don't appreciate him as I should. Priorities are warped if one finds more joy in the things of the world than in the God who has given us all good things, both for this life and in the next. Verse 7, let the sea roar in all its fullness. The world and those who dwell in it, let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. The Bible says, let the mountains sing together for joy. When I picture, for example, 
the various peaks of the Rocky Mountains singing praise to God like a barbershop quartet, which is kind of what this reminds me of. I'm, I'm reminded of some of those real old cartoons, either Warner Brother or Disney or whatever, where they're so animated that, that not just animals are talking and singing and doing stuff, but even various things in nature, mountains and trees and water, who knows. Maybe you've seen some of those old cartoons, but that's what I think of when I think of this verse. More importantly, like I said, the Rockies are majestic. If you've ever been out there, you know that. I would actually say in a sense they are conservative, or maybe a better word would be they are reserved. Because they just remain where they are. They're there. And they do not change. They just stand there majestically presiding over the western United States. But here God says that they should let loose in his presence. Poetically speaking, even the mountains ought to forget themselves and burst into praise toward God their creator. Verse 9, For he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. Those who do not live by God's objective standards of truth those who do not abide by God's immovable and objective standards of right and wrong need to know that whether they do or not, God does. And that's not going to change. God operates by his standards of right and wrong, and he will hold his creation. He will hold his people to his standards, even those who do not believe in him. Someone says, I don't believe in God. And I don't believe in his standards, so this whole thing is irrelevant. None of it applies to me. It applies to everyone. All of it does. Whether you believe it or not, that doesn't change reality. Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord reigns. You know that President Obama as a ruler. Any president does. Maybe by the time you're listening to this or watching this, somebody else will be president. Presidents have a ruler. Congressmen, senators, prime minister, even kings have a ruler. The Bible says that the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns, God says, so let the nations tremble, let the earth move. Any ruler who doesn't rule with the fear of God is a fool. They can be a Rhodes Scholar, but they score an F on the test of wisdom if they do not rule with the fear of God. And that's because they will answer to God for the things that they promote as a leader. Verses 1 through 3, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, for he is holy. Verse 3 that God says, I should say verse 3 says that God is holy, which simply means that he is set apart. That's what the word means. It means to be separated or set apart, which also means that he is different. Different in a perfect way. Different in a righteous way. God is different from us because we do things that are morally wrong. We also think things that are morally wrong. Sometimes we have morally wrong attitudes. And what I am saying is that sin is at work in you and I. But God is perfect. God cannot do wrong. Which is why verse 1 says that we should tremble when we think of him. He loves us, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have a holy, respectful fear of him. Verse 4. The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. God, notice, is just, he is righteous, and he is equal, meaning fair. Just, righteous, fair. Which means that there is never a legitimate reason to be angry at God. Never. Never a legitimate reason to be upset with God. 
And also, also, there is never a legitimate reason to respond sinfully to any unpleasant circumstances. Remember this, no matter who the human target of our sin is, it is always primarily, first and foremost, a direct hit at God. And he deserves better than that from us because he's perfect, he's righteous, he's just, he's fair. Why respond sinfully to what somebody else has done when sin is primarily a hit at God? What has he done? Nothing. God loves justice. He's not responsible for any bad because the Bible says he does what is just and right. God is always fair. God our Father, God our King never makes a mistake in how he deals with his children, which makes any unbiblical attitude, word, or action we display inexcusable all the time. Verse 5. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Now, we just learned about God's justice, fairness, and righteousness. And here in verse 5, we learn that those things about God are all outgrowths of his holiness. And decent people will do what the last part of verse 5 says, worship God because of that. Decent people will appreciate those things about God and worship him all the more for them. Holiness means that God has standards, not just for us, but for himself. His holiness governs him. And I'm thrilled that God is holy because that means that God is good. And it also means that he cares about us. And it also means that he can be trusted. I'm glad that God is holy because that means he's never in a bad mood for no reason at all like people sometimes are. God doesn't wake up in a bad mood. He doesn't just all of a sudden become ornery for no reason at all. He doesn't have a bad mood today. I'm going to send a whole host of angels and I'm going to tell them to watch that Moret person carefully. And boy, oh boy, if he makes even any little mistake, I want you to kick him halfway across the galaxy, which the angels could do, by the way, and which they would do if God ever told them to do it, but he doesn't because he's not that way. He's holy. I'm glad he's holy. Verse 6, Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. You answered them, O Lord our God. You were to them God who forgives. Though you took vengeance on their deeds, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. And we learn three things about God in these verses. Number one, we learn that God hears our prayers. Number two, we learn that God forgives our sins. And number three, we learn that God also disciplines his children when they do what is wrong. God hears our prayers. Just because you don't get everything you ask for doesn't mean that God wasn't listening. He listens and he does what is best. God hears our prayers. God forgives our sins. You would think, wouldn't you, that a God who is so perfectly holy would not tolerate any sin at all ever, even for a minute? But he does. He puts up with it. And the Bible says if a Christian confesses their sin, God is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. God hears our prayers, God forgives our sins, and God disciplines his children when they do wrong. So we see that the Bible gives us a very balanced view of God. And we dare not exclude from our thinking any part of that balance, any aspect of God. And that's why I teach the scripture verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation to get the complete picture. Very important. I don't want to overemphasize anything and exclude something else because then you're not getting an accurate picture of God. And if you have any questions for me, comments, prayer requests, 
I would like you to send them in. I need to hear from you. I would love to hear from you. And please don't sit on the sidelines. Please become a part of this ministry, would you? Help me get out the word of God. We are reaching, last count, it was about 138, 139 countries in the world with the gospel. Many of them, many of them Muslim countries via the internet. Wonderful. So, pray for this ministry, would you? Don't stand on the sidelines. Be a part of this ministry. My address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasa, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasa, 54402-2211. You can email your questions and your comments to versebyverse at live.com. That's verse by verse at live.com. And you can also call in your questions and comments. That telephone number is 715-845-8298. 715-845-8298. Leave your question and your comment. And a telephone number, I'll get back with you as soon as I can. I appreciate you standing with me. And, and if you're in the Wassa area and you're looking for a place to worship this Sunday morning, you are come, you're welcome to come and join us. Again, if you want entertainment, then don't come because it won't be there. But if you want just a simple, pure worship service, lasts about 55 minutes with the Word of God, verse by verse, then I think you'll be blessed. And I invite you to come. We meet 10 o'clock Sunday mornings, Island Place, which is right next to Oak Island here in Wausau. It's 10 o'clock Sunday morning, Island Place, right next to Oak Island here in Wausau. And if you need directions, call 715-845-8298. 715-845-8298 or again that email verse by verse at live.com verse by verse at live.com until next time michael moret for scripture verse by verse thank you for spending this time with me so long everyone <laughs>